Hi viewers and listeners, wherever you are in the world. We are at the ESPD55 conference, that is the Ethnopharmacological Search for Psychoactive Drugs conference. It's the 55th year anniversary since the original. And this time it's hosted by Dennis McKenna and the McKenna Academy at St. Giles's House, a magnificent country manor in Dorset, England. With me are the famed fungi researcher Paul Stametz to the left and ethnobotanist and rainforest conservationist Mark Plotkin who has a podcast titled Plants of the Gods covering plant hallucinogens amongst many other things. We are in the fourth and final day of the conference. So gentlemen, perhaps we can begin with uh, sharing some of your thoughts on this event. <laughs> You're my senior, you go. Okay. Well, it's an incredible gathering of leaders in the field of microbiology, ethnobotany, ethnomycology, and it's a very interdisciplinary discipline where I think everybody's here to both teach and learn. And that's kind of unique. Usually when you go to a conference, you're there to lecture as much, as, much more than you are to listen, in my experience. And so being here to both teach and to learn is, is very fulfilling. There's an enormous deep well of expertise here with a diversity uh, of people who've spent all their lives studying this subject. And we are, you know, on a continuum of thought leaders over thousands of years. In a sense, we're carrying some of the torches now to pass on to the next generation. But although there's such a diversity of expertise here, there's a commonality and unanimity of opinion. And that unanimity of opinion is that these sacred medicines are teaching us how important it is to protect the Earth's biosphere. And the biosphere is in jeopardy, and the lessons from indigenous people, and we're all indigenous to the Earth, so it's indigenous people throughout the world have are singing the same song, or shouting the same warning, and that is unified together, we can help protect future generations and honor our ancestors and protect our descendants. And the cautionary concerns I think we all share is the system has become destabilized and it's destabilizing to a very dangerous level. The repercussions of human activity is gonna have a collateral damage on the innocents. And the innocents are people who are very well intended. The innocents could be people oblivious to so much of the climate chaos that other people in the world are, are suffering. And this is a concern. We have to become ecologically better educated. We need wisdom in our actions so we can protect the ecosystem. And so I'm really delighted to be here with my brother Mark. <laughs> and we've been in, in hyperspace um, in common, if not physically in pro close proximity. But I feel like I've known you for thousands of years. I feel like I've known Paul longer than thousands of years, but we'll declare it a tie. For me, this is one of the great aspects of this conference to finally meet the great Paul Stamets in person. I, I personally knew Gordon Wasson. I trained at the museum, and he was uh, and is regarded as the father of ethnomycology. But in my book, Paul Stamets has taken that position since Gordon has moved on. And to hear someone speak with his depth of knowledge field knowledge, time with indigenous peoples, time with the fungi, to talk about the diversity of all things. Because when I started in conservation, it was all about the rainforest and elephants and whales. Nobody talked about indigenous peoples, and God forbid you didn't even think of fungi. Yeah. Well, let me add on to that. I, I met uh, Gordon several times. Um, I went to three or four of his lectures. And let this historical record be very clear. Every lecture that I attended by R. Gordon Wasson the first thing he expressed is his love and gratitude and acknowledgement of his wife, Tina Wasson, to the point where he would be cascading with tears, just re-remembering her. It was Tina Wasson, Valentina Wasson, a Russian physician, who first ex exposed and turned on and actually informed Gordon Wasson about mushrooms. He was mycophobic. She was mycophilic. They invented those words to dis describe the dialectic of their two points of view from a cultural perspective. And then from that dance of those dialectical opposites was born this lifelong study 
And so Valentina, unfortunately, uh, Tina Watson died in 1958 at the height of this reemergence, so to speak. And then their knowledge came from Maria Sabina. So really, you have two giants, uh, two elders, two incredibly wise women who were really the, the birth of this, this reemergence. And it's from the generosity and collaboration of these woman elders that really set the stage. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. Even though Gordon Wasson gets all the credit, it needs to really be rebalanced. Tina Wasson should get the majority of the credit. Our Gordon Wasson was Tina's student, <laughs> you know? Well, I did a podcast episode called The Holy Trinity of Ethnomycology, Schultes, Wasson, and, uh, and Hoffman. And I said, we have to expand that to five people. That has to be Maria Sabina and Tina Wasson. And interestingly enough, looking at that timeline you, you referred to, Paul, if you look at my favorite paper of Wasson's, The Death of Claudius, Mushroom for Murders, it's by R. Gordon Wasson, even though Tina played a key role. But when the last great act of his life, he donated everything to Harvard, and he insisted to be called the Tina and Gordon Wasson yes. Ethnomycological Library. So I think he came to that realization himself long before we did. And I'm happy to be the first recipient of the Tina and Gordon Wasson Award from the Mycological Society of America. And that is now an annual position or honor that's been given to emergent uh, experts in the field. So we have just an interesting union, a pairing of opposites, this dance that I'd like to, to get into. Most people may not realize that all plants are part f fungi. The endophytic fungi that are inside the plants are producing a lot of alkaloids and indeed a lot of tryptamines. Mm -hmm. And the plants are producing tryptamines. But I like to say we're in this beautiful place and I'm staring out over this great scene of many diverse trees and grasses. And, and if you stripped away all the cellulose, all the lignine, everything but tryptamines, what would we see? Fungi. <laughs> we would see <laughs> fungal networks and you would see the very same shape of grasses and trees. That, they're a universal molecule of nature. Um, and they're es essential, essential to life. And so I, I find that fascinating. We live, live in a tryptamine universe and yet we can't see the tryptamines. And now with the introduction of admixtures and, you know, MAOI, um, monoamine uh, oxidase inhibitors with tryptamine containing plants. You know, I'm, I'm real interested in looking at the non psilocybin active mushrooms, using it with perhaps Syrian rue, uh, which contains MAOI inhibitors. Now, let me, let me have a big precautionary statement here because this gets into some medically important issues. If you are on antidepressants, oftentimes which have MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and you have, for instance, um, seafood and cheese and red wine, um, and then you take a tryptamine-rich uh, plant, tyrosines can pass through the system, which raises your blood pressure and can cause cardiac arrest. So this is why I think indigenous people's knowledge has been so critical for setting the stage, you know, of preparation. You don't consume food before, you know, ingest ayahuasca, before you trip on mushrooms. You clear your belly so you don't have this co-occurrence. So this is something, with the experimentation of MOA, MAOIs, I think it's really important that people understand the, um, that they fast. They do not eat foods um, that will allow some of these toxins to go through. Remember, monoamine uh, oxidases are important for you. They detoxify you know, uh, uh, compounds in your stomach that would otherwise be deleterious. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, it, it's the double-edged sword. It's very shamanic what you say, Paul, because on the one hand, ayahuasca is not just ayahuasca. There's always something else mixed in, speaking of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. By the same token, you shouldn't take some medicines with grapefruit juice. Oh, so there you go. this yeah. is something where Western medicine has really failed us in terms of not looking at interactions, 
uh, which are both positive and negative. And I think this is part of the future of medicine. And in some ways, this just proves the genius of, of what I was taught in classes are primitive peoples, mm -hmm. where they say, don't eat this before you eat these mushrooms or before you take this snuff or whatever, whatever, whatever. And we're coming around to the idea that if you're going to spend your life taking anti-cholesterol drugs, uh, anti-high blood pressure blood pressure drugs, we need to figure out what the effect is in the human body for 40 years. Indeed, and that's a, that's a precautionary statement. People experimenting with MAOIs must be extraordinarily careful. Yes, yeah. And, and that, that brings up another point. You know, Michael Pollan's wonderful book, he talks about the fact that uh, often the people that seek out the magic mushrooms or going down in the Amazon to take ayahuasca <coughs> are emotionally very fragile, emotionally unstable. And these are the last people that should be doing stuff without a master in charge, whether it's a doctor, a physician, or a guide, what have you. So there's a great need for people that can direct these things. There aren't enough shamans to go around, not in, not in Oaxaca, not in the Amazon, um, to, to make sure that people are, 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 are prepped correctly and managed correctly. And if you get in trouble, which everybody does at some point, there's somebody to help you through. And with the advancement of any medicine, there's always going to be casualties. Right. And the, the cost of these casualties is to inform science uh, how to better have therapeutic guardrails that are established. So this is, happens with any adventure, you know, scientific adventures, whether it's a, a voyage across the ocean or an exploration into the North Pole. We learn from the lessons of our experiences. We're really in a continuum of rediscovering or discovering nature um, and all of its bounty and all of its combinations. The, it, the timelines of, of the use of entheogenic plants are not set in stone. It's not like they had a start date and a stop date. Right. It's a continuum that goes into the future. All of you listening to this right now, you, know, you will be the in, inventors where humans are natural experimenters. Uh, the cost of that experimentation can be severe. So uh, eyes wide open and being extraordinarily careful and, you know, I am going to sound like a conservative here, but it's really important, especially now, that you do things legally. Because illegal activity could be a train wreck for this movement. True. You know, the advance right now through government, uh, through uh, ballot measures, through, uh, you know, state initiatives and hopefully national initiatives, we're close to the end zone here. Mm -hmm. We can't fumble the ball. Right. So we have an, we need an extraordinary amount of discipline. We need people to be adults. And um, I think this is a time critical that we can get past, you know, into the goal zone yep. of having a, a fundamental change in the understanding of psychedelics in particular uh, to, where the governments realize that psychedelics are not addictive, in fact, they're anti-addictive. Article that was published, I think, April 7th in Nature's um, Scientific Reports shows that over, I think, over 114,000 addicts or people who have used opioids, and there's only one psychedelic that was associated with a reduction of opioid use. It's called opioid use disorder, psilocybin. Now think, if psilocybin reduces opioid use, and opioid use is a fundamental problem throughout our society. How, how much money that saves the government, how it saves families, how the court system, law enforcement. Yes. We reduce addiction, we reduce crime. And suffering. So, and suffering. And so, I mean, this is, this is huge. I mean, if you could save the budgets of the governments hundreds of billions of dollars through permitting one dose uh, of psilocybin, you know, very rarely, and because it has such a long residual effect, and by definition, psilocybin is anti-addictive. So anybody who's not had a high dose of psilocybin, let me tell you a common refrain. The next day, when you look at the mushrooms, you say, no way. <laughs> I'm not touching this for a well, long time. I can echo that with ayahuasca as well. Yeah. But I don't know if you saw it just about three weeks ago, as we were all preparing for this conference here in England, there was a paper on a new plant which blocks opiate uh, addiction. And it's a papaveraceae, it's opium family. Wow. Totally from left field. Wow. So what I am telling people is, 
uh, psilocybin is not the end of the story, even if it is the Einstein molecule, nor is ayahuasca, nor is coca. There's more stuff out there, which is why, A, we need to protect what's out there, and B, we need to learn from the people that know these things. Indigenous peoples do not know everything, but they've led us to most of these things. But here's a question for you, because I've listened to so many interviews with you and so many of your talks, people don't ask you about the future. What do you think's out there in the fungal world medicinally? What, what can you see in your, your fungal crystal ball in terms of the next beta blockers or the next uh, antibiotics for drug resistant uh, bugs? Well, very clearly, the research that we've been doing, um, and I have literally spent more than a million dollars on uh, testing uh, psilocybin, psilocybin analogs, it's psilocin, psilocybin mm -hmm. is a prodrug for psilocin, psilocybin is stable, psilocin is not, psilocybin when you ingest it converts to psilocin, that's what gets into your bloodstream and, 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 and activates your receptors. And we found a massive amount of neurogeneration, uh, mm -hmm. especially from the psilocybin analogs. What's neurogeneration? Neurogeneration is literally what it sounds like, N nerves regenerate. Now, there's four terms of art here. There's a neurogenesis, which is the origination of newborn nerve cells, typically from stem cells. Mm -hmm. There's neurogeneration, mm -hmm. which means you're generating new neurons. There's neuron mm -hmm. regeneration from neurons that begin to atrophy. They're starting to die back right. and, they, and they rebound. Mm -hmm. And I think really as exciting as neurogenesis is neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. Neuroplasticity speaks to uh, synapt synaptogenesis. More nerves uh, are branching, more conduits. So you can imagine if you had neuropathy with, with one string of neurons with neuroplasticity, you mm -hmm. have more alternative routes for signal transmission. That with niacin seems to be a catalyst. And then adding lion's mane, uh, the mycelium, this is where we have found this coded for an upregulation of, of what's called MAP kinases, and these mm -hmm. stimulate, uh, these are proteins that dock with the, the, the nerve cells, mm -hmm. and upon docking, they, they cause proliferation, or mm -hmm. in stem cells, it causes them to differentiate in the nerve cells. So what's out there is that, you, in my phrase, you know, uh, uh, psilocybes uh, and psilocybin is the Einstein molecule, right. or the Einstein mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are on the road, and we have a paper coming out in Nature, Mm -hmm. scientific reports very, very soon. Uh, we have a psychomotor benefit that we can show mm -hmm. where microdosing with psilocybin, niacin, and lion's mane increases the tap test mm -hmm. from 48 to 68 taps in 10 seconds mm -hmm. with an observational study uh, with 55 plus year olds. So you don't see this in younger people. Mm -hmm. Well, microdosing with psilocybin by itself had no effect mm -hmm. and the non-microdosers steadily declined. Right. Um, they hit, got, maybe got habituated, they got bored, they got fatigued. But the people on the stack of these three compounds showed statistically significant. The p-value is 0 0.004. Mm -hmm. When you look at all the dilutable factors, you have uncontrolled people microdosing with psilocybin they're buying on the, on the black market, variability in potency, right. the variability in the amount of niacin they're taking, and lion's mane. And yet that would all dilute out significance, and yet we have such extraordinary significance. So mm -hmm. the future, I think, is that these psilocybin molecules and other tryptamines stack with niacin in particular, mm -hmm. lion's mane regenerates myelin on the axons of the nerves. I think we can increase our neurological health and age uh, and offset the neurological decline. Mm -hmm. And this could be pen potentially, has to be proven by clinical studies or helping Alzheimer's, dementia, mm -hmm. uh, Parkinson's, uh, MS, traumatic brain injury. And uh, note to self, as we get older, we're on a slippery slope of neurodegeneration. So True. it wouldn't be nice if, if the Einsteins of our era, when they're in the 80s and 90s, are at the peak of their intellectual acumen yeah. capacity so they can pass the knowledge on to the next Fabulous. generation. Fabulous. You know, so that's what I think the future is. We can become more intelligent, and I think psilocybin creates smarter, nicer people. Living proof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What about in terms of uh, antivirals? That's a big, big subject. And um, so, but this, this brings up a bigger subject. I'm an outlier. I didn't get my PhD. I applied and I got uh, accepted in the four or five graduate schools, but I had, I had adopted a family, a family of five. I couldn't afford to move everybody. So I'm self-taught. Um, 
But I have my fourth paper in Nature, <laughs> so not, not too bad. Right. Because I'm self-taught. But my research on, on helping bees overcoming colony collapse I know. is important. Mm -hmm. So you can Google Nature, uh, Stamets, uh, bees, um, antivirals. And we discovered a reishi mushroom extract made mm -hmm. from the mycelium, again, not the mushrooms. The mycelium are much more, uh, have many more genes activated as they navigate through a habitat, so they're constantly in competition. Mm -hmm. Mushroom comes up and rots really, really quickly. So the mycelium can be resonant for years. And so it's a very, very active in its immune system. So we take the living mycelium, make a water ethanol extract, add it to the honey, the sugar water we're giving to bees. And working with Washington State University, we published this in Nature. I checked uh, the day before yesterday, it's in the 0.1% of all articles uh, ever downloaded on the Nature publication uh, Ecosystem. That's pretty extraordinary. It's very extraordinary. Uh, but that's a measure of the interest because the natural extracts reduce, in one case, a vir this one virus that harms bees by 45,000 to one. With one treatment in 10 days, outdoors in beehives, this is an animal clinical study. I think it's the first example where a natural product is more powerful than an antiviral pharmaceutical, for which there is none for bees. But it, that's why I think there's so much attention. There's an urgent need. It's coming from a natural product. The, res, the results are clearly valid. And so what does that mean? That means that mycelium that cruises throughout the ecosystem is offering immunological benefits to many of the animals. So this could have be helpful for fighting bird flu, monkeypox, you know, COVID, um, many viral vectors that are converging on us in a time of increasing viral storms, protecting the forest, could it be protecting our immune system of the planet and the individual animals within, including us and bees. So I think this is the tip of the iceberg. So when they give the Nobel Prize for Apiology, have you written your speech? <laughs> so talk to me for a minute about the shamanic connection between uh, bees and honey and mushrooms. That's fascinating. Um, well, you know, the phrase necessity is the mother of invention. Right. Imagine this, you're, you're, you're a Mesoamerican indigenous person. You collect Psilocybe Mexicana, whatever it is. Um, it's humid, it's wet. That's, the, the, that's why the mushrooms are coming up. You pick them. The mushrooms are gone in three to four days. Mm -hmm. How do you preserve them? Right. You try to dry them. Mm -hmm. I was in Palenque, you've been in Palenque. Drying mushrooms in Palenque is not easy. <laughs> humidity is 100% dry. humidity, no. Right. So you can put them in honey. Mm -hmm. Well, in the, the Bavarian Beer Act of 1516, if I got my date right, you can look it up, um, they banned mushrooms in beer. Mm -hmm. And they were making meads back then. Mm -hmm. So, and then you look at the cave art from northern Nigeria, the famous Tassili cave art with mm -hmm. a bee man. As a bee figure man or woman, Surrounded by mushrooms, right? So the idea of preservation, mother, you know, invention is, is, is the mother of in, necessity is the mother of invention. Right. Then three disparate cultures, there's evidence clearly that honey is a preservative. Well, who knew that? Well, lots of people knew that. So that I think speaks to these concoctions. Um, and Andy Weil gets tons of credit for the natural mind. Correct. And I read that too. And when he's talked about people spinning to get dizzy as fun and children do it, this impulse to change your consciousness is innate within us. That's the classic. Um, so these non-ordinary states of reality, I think we need to pay attention to. Um, and I, I, could, I could follow this up with another thought or two, but let, let me just try it. Let me just try it. How about it? I believe it's the minorities within civilizations and societies that drive evolution. The conventional wisdom, by definition, is the majority. Right. The outliers, like you, me, Tina, Tina Wasson, <laughs> Maria Sabina, mm -hmm. you know, dominant cultures come in, suppress minority opinion. The outliers are thought to be on the fringe, but they're not on the fringe. They're on the edge, the cusp, of scientific advancement and breakthrough. And so it's the minorities that have to be protected Mm -hmm. Because they're the innovators, and the uh, convention will list them are, unfortunately, the oppressors. The oppressor-dominant society suppresses the minority views, and yet the minority you know, 
individuals, these are the leaders of, of change. And this is why we need to protect all minorities. Couldn't agree more. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think we sell these things short when we talk about them as hallucinogens. Yes, they induce hallucinations, but it's so much more. I mean, entheogens, okay, they induce the God within. But what about the creative process? What about the great ideas? What about curing your stammer? You yeah, know, I still have ca it. Calling it hallucinogens, it's just, it's, it's reductionist. It is. Uh, it's, it, and an and inadequacy of our language, you know, psychedelic was invented. Entheogens... That's about the best one that's out there right now, feeling imbued with the spirit of God, I would say goodness. Um, so this is something that I think is truly remarkable. We have not even begun to understand the potential positive benefits of these, of these sacraments. Um, and indigenous wisdom has really set the stage. It's been the foundation for scientific advancement. What's so exciting to me as a scientist is to see how much indigenous wisdom is validated, but upon that is improved. You know, so it's the best of both worlds. It's the best of both worlds. Yeah, There's absolutely. a phrase I heard recently, and a Native American elder, in explaining to a group of elementary children. Uh, the importance of getting a Western education, mm -hmm. you know, and it's two-eyed seeing. And as he explained it, one eye with an indigenous perspective, with the wisdom of indigenous culture, the other eye with Western education. And with two eyes, you can see much clearer and better than with one eye. And this is an indigenous invented phrase Many of the indigenous people I know, they're now mulatto, quote unquote, they're mixed, mixed blood. Mm -hmm. uh, my son is 17, my daughter is 17% Navajo. Mm -hmm. And so we have so much indigenous history in all of us and so many mm -hmm. of the indigenous people are now getting the benefits of Western medicine, technology, et cetera. And we get the benefits of their ancient wisdom. So I like this idea of two eyes seeing. It brings people together in commonality that we can focus on our future. The past is the past. We must not forget it. There is a lot of regret about the past. We can't change the past. We can forge together to create a new future that is better for everyone. Well, I like this concept of the two I, my, my buddy Tim Ferriss says that all ethnobiologists are boundary walkers by definition. Mm -hmm. And it's more than two boundaries or more than mm -hmm. one boundary, right? Um, I was reading a quote by Horace, the poet laureate of ancient Rome, and he said, no poem was ever written by a drinker of water. Okay, that altered states are necessary. It's not just mushrooms, it's not just plants, it's, it's alcohol, which of course is plants and, and fungi. But that the way these uh, substances can help us uh, enhance creativity, come up with new ideas, new ways of thinking. The flip side is to think that, you know, the more dope you smoke, the wiser you get. We know that's not true. But how do you strike that medium so you're using these things as, uh, as enhancers and you're not trapped in like always wanting to do more or not saying, oh, I can't do that because i I, I got to hold my tenuous grip on reality. Well, many people don't know, know about Bruce Dammer, uh, you know, who's here, and he's, his epiphanies on, from psychoactive experiences. Um, but everyone knows about PCR. Right. And Carrie Mullis. Tell, tell that story. Carrie Mullis discovered LSD. I uh, discovered PCR by taking LSD, being on the beach, and looking at bullwhip kelp. Mm -hmm. And then he, he had the concept of PCR. Crazy guy. He died, unfortunately, a few years ago. The, I think he was the only Nobel laureate that they ever had to call the police on. <laughs> so I heard. <laughs> Tell that story, too. <laughs> I just know that number of wine bottles, you know, he was measuring the, the gravity and acceleration, and he was doing timing and watching, uh, watching wine bottles fall from the 20th floor. <laughs> Drinking them first, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a scientific experiment. Um, but anyhow, but that's an example of where a psychedelic, an epiphany, then you have Watson and Crick the, the, the debated, and then you have a, another group, you know, a, a, another woman scientist also gets credit. But there's many examples of that, where the psychedelic state of mind uh, was the milieu for a creative thinking that led to something truly uh, uh, 
a scientific breakthrough. Okay, so this whole PCR story, and, and PCR, as you know, is one of the greatest inventions in primate history, okay? But there's a second part of this which speaks to the value of nature that's often not told as an almost a, a coda or a denouement, and that is that Thomas Brock went into the hot springs in Yellowstone and pulled the organism out that makes PCR possible. So that it's not just that this guy was tripping his brains out on a motorcycle and doing crazy stuff and came up with this brilliant idea, that it was a natural product which was part of the solution. Uh, and, and that's, Sourced from nature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this idea that, you know, in, in the age of high throughput uh, screening or combinatorial chemistry that we don't need mother nature, I mean, we have to remember that mother nature not only uh, created chemicals too numerous to mention, she created those chemists in the first place. Yeah, yeah indeed. And um, this, this is what, for instance, we see really strong evidence of, uh, of neurogeneration benefit from the entourage of the psilocybin analogs, perfectly legal, baocystin, norbaocystin, norcilocin, and these analogs have neurogenic uh, activity. So now you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, you know, I mentioned this, there's 89 studies, um, almost every one of them is the psilocybin molecule. Right. Yet no one's using the psilocybin molecule in public. You know, 99.999% of people are using psilocybin cubensis. Mm -hmm. It has the entourage effect mm -hmm. of these other analogs. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who is a medical doctor who approved by the Canadian government has taken two cohorts, nine and seven people, uh, through end of life with high doses of psilocybin. Mm -hmm. This last cohort, um, there were people taking uh, the psilocybin molecule and a person taking the psilocybin mushroom. Mm -hmm. The other person who had taken psilocybin mushrooms had taken the psilocybin molecule before. Mm -hmm. And so it's the first really good description of the difference. Do you want to know what the difference was between the molecule versus the mushroom? Hit it. Yeah, okay. They described it as this. The psilocybin molecule, I realize you take it, psilocybin pure form, goes to your gut, very quickly metabolized, right? You don't have mm -hmm. to break it down. Mm -hmm. So they described it as like the experience was like a box. They took it and it went way up like this, had this plateau, mm -hmm. extraordinarily powerful experience, and then dropped down. Mm -hmm. And then it, the experience was over. Mm -hmm. Well, this, that person described when they, th they took the psilocybin mushrooms, it was this slope which makes sense, it's being digested. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have more you know, entourage effect of these psilocybin analogs. It sloped up, had this peak experience, mm -hmm. but he said the most valuable thing was when it was sloping down, which has sloped down for a long time, he was able to process. Excellent. He was able to think. Mm -hmm. He was able to contemplate, reflect. It was like, you know, I used to hang glide, mm -hmm. and those us hang gliders out there, there's, it's a great feeling if you do a heroic flight, <laughs> to come down on green grass at a very slow, nice glide, <laughs> as opposed to plummeting you exactly. know, to the earth. Exactly, better than a plummet. So, but so, yeah, so there's interesting. It's more meditative. It's more contemplative. We know that neurogenically, we believe, again, it has to be proven by clinical studies, uh, but it, I think it offers more benefit. So the, so the entourage effect of these complex molecular uh, you know, mixtures offers a benefit that the individual molecules do not. Describe the entourage effect. The entourage effect is when you have uh, several ingredients, molecules, you can call them, that individually may offer some benefit, but when you add them together, it's not only cumulative, like one plus one plus one equals three, but one plus one plus one equals 10. And so you have synergism. Mm -hmm. So the entourage effect implies synergism, mm -hmm. where you get much more activity. The greatest, one of the greatest ex examples that's commonly used is gunpowder. Mm -hmm. The Chinese invented gunpowder, mm -hmm. uh, but the patent office, for instance, has this as a gating issue. How can you patent a natural product? Right. Well, they use gunpowder. If it was not invented, it was invented today mm -hmm. by an inventor, you take sulfur, charcoal, uh, and potassium nitrate. I'm right. not revealing anything that's, right. that's not known. But individually of which they don't have an effect. The right. entourage effect of those three is explosive. Yep. That's Literally. what we're finding with the tryptamines right. and, these, and ayahuasca, and I, I believe in, you know, for sure in mushrooms. I think we're gonna see this, this, this explosive synergism Excellent. of entourage, mm -hmm. um, which is, makes it truly, truly exciting. 
Now, one of the things that I find most commonly misunderstood about the fungal kingdom and, and medicine and mind-altering substances is I keep reading that Hoffman invented LSD. And Nature invented LSD. Exactly. <laughs> so please, I, I want people to well, get it I'm, from I, you. I mean, fungi, this comes from Aragog, a, a class of purpurea, is... Um, is an ergot fungus, and I th all these fungi are miniature chemical factories. Mm -hmm. They're producing hundreds of thousands of exotic molecules not found elsewhere in nature. Mm -hmm. But here's an example. There's a pachonia fungus uh, that now we know produces ketamine. Mm -hmm. So ketamine was not found, thought to be found in nature, and now we yes. have a fungus that's producing it. Yes. Nature created ketamine before chemists created ke ketamine, Got it totally backwards. My total, my so I make a prediction exactly. that we'll find a fungus that will produce MDMA. You know, MDMA is an amphetamine. It turns out that a number of fungi produce amphetamine, including Massospora, uh, which is a fungus um, uh, that, uh, uh, that has been found recently in the past few years. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought on this. You know, on, uh, uh, no, I mean, um, the, the idea that it all comes from the laboratory is just uh, w what you're saying, that nature got there first. Nature bats last. Yeah, uh, for sure. And that um, it, it's part of the story that is undertold or misunderstood. And So, uh, no, I'm sorry, I reconnected the neuron on that one. Um, it's called Massospora cicadensis. It's a, <laughs> it's a fungus that that um, infects cicada, which are in the ground for 17 years. And in Ohio, I saw a cicada outbreak. You know, it's like a locust outbreak. It's mm -hmm. incredibly loud and just bugs everywhere. And they all emerge mm -hmm. in for a two to four week period. And, and they mate and then they die. But they, they have the, through the, just prior to molting, um, many of them get this fungus. And this fungus is really Bizarre. It produces these amphetamine-like compounds. It produces a minute amount of psilocybin, um, but the amphetamines make these these uh, uh, these insects um, fly, and you and it uh, demasculizes and actually rots out rots off the genitals of the male cicadas, and they effeminizes their behavior, so they have a seductive dance. So other males were close, and so the spores then, putatively, we believe, can infect the, the new ones. And then they, you know, and then, you know, they go down underground, you know, um, uh, eggs are laid, you know, pupae and larvae develop, and the fungus then survives. Um, so how bizarre that you would have an amphetamine and a psychoactive tryptamine, psilocybin, being produced by a fungus that parasitizes cicadas. And so, now the chemistry of this is much, much more complex than I initially uh, uh, noticed. There's a great group of scientists that wrote a paper on this. So please, you know, check out their paper on Massapora cicadensis. This is why many ethnobiologists don't read science fiction. This <laughs> nature is more perverse than you can't any make this. You can't make this shit up. Exactly. You know? It's just crazy. And, and in uh, Merlin Sheldrake's book, he calls them crazed, Sex crazed psychedelic salt shaker cicadas, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is going to be hard to top. Yeah, I mean, just um, what else is out there, you know? Exactly. And you know, this this goes. You know, I I've had a visionary dream that came true that was just so profound, um, and I put it in one of my books against the objections of many many people. This is way before the concept of the multiverse. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets, we push the envelope of, our, of what we consider to be reality, what we consider to be consciousness, what we consider to be schizophrenia, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or illusions of grandeur. But the Aztecs used psilocybin mushrooms to see into the future. Mm -hmm. that, well documented. I mean, mm -hmm. that was one of their visionary quests. That's a big thing, yeah. And they found it as a military advantage. Mm -hmm. let's, let's be able to go into hyperspace to understand what's coming. Right. So let's not uh, uh, doubt the wisdom of indigenous Aztecs. In my own experience, as much as my, if people vilified for me putting it in writing, it's in my book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. I mean, 
Aztecs may not have been wrong. I may have been wrong. I may have gotten a glimpse into the multiverse. Now, again, we suffer from the inadequacy of language. So even trying to describe this, we fail, I'm sure. Um, but it just is a sense there's a lot more out there uh, than we certainly uh, now can comprehend. You know, I did my thesis research with a tribe called the Wayanas, and they say that when people want to be a healer, when people take psychedelics, they're trying to gain some special sight, like a sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. But they have a different view of the world and reality. They say that we're all born with that sixth or seventh sense, mm -hmm. but that becoming a shaman means removing the blind field, mm -hmm. that it's not about learning how to see anew, it means moving what's blocking you. And when you look at William Blake, talking about the doors of perception and, and, and peering through the cracks, we're, mo we're rolling away the stone. And, 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 and modern psychology is now accepted that little children under the age of four can have an imaginary friend. Yes. You know, they see other, other spirits and, and that's considered to be, oh, that's actually part of being a child. Uh, so that, that's curious to me is even psychology is saying, no, it's okay if you're, you're a three-year-old has an imaginary friend, or an, and, but then you grow up and as you get older, it's then, been, it's then you get narrowed you. vision and all that recedes. You know, we've all had the experience where you dreamed about somebody you hadn't seen since fifth grade, and then the next day they're on the seat in front of you in the plane. Yeah. And we're taught, oh, that's a coincidence. There's, there's nothing shamanic about that. It's just bullshit. There are no imaginary friends. There is no look into the future. Anybody who's had these experiences with these altered realities knows there are other realities. And if you open it up further, where you don't really need... Uh, psychoactive substance to have these types of Well, this is uh, such a strange, th and a good, I'm really excited about this, because it's such a strange conversation. Okay, the re conservative religious people out there could say, this, this, these two guys, Mark and Paul, are batshit crazy. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, what about the belief in Jesus Christ? What is about the belief in God? You can't prove God. Right? right? Faith, by definition, is faith. It's right. like you're suspending logical deduction, analytical right. analysis. And it's a suspension of disbelief to believe in an ephemeral entity that you can't see, touch, feel. But because it's a Christian religion, it's okay. But I'm, you believe in UFOs. I'm with you. You there. believe in little people. I'm with you. You, there. you believe in something else you can't see. That you can't have the suspension of disbelief. And so to me, it's like, it's, it's like, you know, it's like the lie of Santa Claus. When they lied to me about Santa Claus, when I, when I found out I was seven or eight years of age, I said, well, okay, what about Jesus? All right, come on now. If you're, you're what about be Amanita Muscari? <laughs> 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 I took Richard Schulte's night school course on Plants for the Bible. And in the first class, he described that, you know, there's other religions, like the idea of the Tucanos, that humans came from the Milky Way in a sacred canoe with ayahuasca, coca, and manioc. And afterwards, this old lady ran up to the front of the class and said, Professor, I hope we're not going to waste a lot of time on that sort of nonsense. And he says, nonsense? You mean like uh, a snake chasing a naked woman through a garden with an apple in his mouth? Or the Mormons? <laughs> <laughs> Some other planet <laughs> that you go to? I mean, really? I, it's, if we're going to have a tolerance for religion, we should have a tolerance for all the religions. Not the dominant religion in one culture. Whether it's Judaism, whether it's is Islam, whether it's Christianity, whether it's the the, 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 uh, the use of Yahe in the Amazonia, these are all core religious beliefs. They tend to add structure to society to protect the commons, but they're abused by people in positions of power, who then use that authority to become authoritarian to suppress minority opinion. I keep on coming back to this. It's so important that we protect minority opinion. These are the edge runners, the edge thinkers. These are the ones who are contrarians, who are pushing the envelope. Sure, a lot of them are gonna, are weird, they're different. Many, we now have this phrase that people are on the spectrum. Uh, you included. We're all on the We're spectrum on at the some spectrum. point. We're some of the most ingenious, genius people that I know are maladapted socially, but they're incredibly talented and they contribute so much. 
So I think this is this is really we need to have tolerance of diversity, and and be able to have these these minority opinions be able to be expressed without oppression. Well, a follow-on to that. My worry coming out of this great conference is psychedelic megachurches. Oh, no. Because as religions gain more power and more adherence, there's more potential for abuse. So yes, we need to have more tolerance for everybody, but when a religion starts becoming destructive, well, the mega churches will have structure. They'll have they'll have ties. They'll have fees. They'll have infrastructure. Accountants. They'll have assistance, et cetera, et cetera. But we what about being able to go into the forest with yourself and a loved one, and have your your spiritual experience without the constructs you know, of organized religion? But that's got to be recognized as 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 a form of religion that should be a form a part of all religions. Nature bathing, forest bathing. Which well, people I get think, away from. I think um, it's a fundamental civil right of every citizen on this planet to have the rights to their own consciousness. And I think every conservative, every Republican, libertarian out there, they don't want the government interfering with their personal life. Their threshold of their home, you know, right. is the barrier they can do inside their home as long as they don't hurt somebody, whatever they wish to do. And I think that that perimeter is not your doorway, and not only your doorway, it's, it's your cranial cavity. We should be able to be able to protect and have the freedom to our own consciousness. No government should be able to tell you and control your own consciousness. It seems to me what I know of organized religion, and I'm no student of religions, but that in, in every major religion, you have a, 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 a love of nature and a disdain of nature. And, and, and that has to be worked out better. For example, when the Endangered Species Act looked like it was going down under Newt Gingrich, it was the evangelicals who showed up on Capitol Hill and said, species, God made them, we protect them. They were the ones that came to the rescue. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned Newt Gingrich, because I published this new species called Psilocybe Wileyi after Andrew Weil, uh, and it fruited in Newt Gingrich's front yard of his political office in Georgia. And so the, the I mean, these mushrooms have a sense of humor. Clearly, you know, so that's it's just like I could not believe it. It was like, and that's where so many of the cells I've mushrooms in the Northwest. They fruit around jails, courthouses, you know, institutions of higher learning. This is why the campuses suddenly had cells I've mushrooms everywhere from wood chips. You know, when there's a beauty bark and wood chip for landscaping, where they use it. They use it around big buildings and cities, right? And around schools, right. and that's why cells I've mushrooms showed up in the '70s. Like crazy, and Daniel Stuntz, who's a professor at the University of Washington, uh, head of the botany slash mycology department, when he was brought these psilocybin mushrooms, studied mycology all of his life, he's never seen them, and they were proliferating everywhere around his laboratory. In fact, the species became named Psilocybe stuntsii uh, af, 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 after Daniel Stuntz. So, because, I heard so, you. so that, that's another example that these mushrooms seem to leap up at a time critical. And then I became a student of his, and here I am today. I heard you tell that story in a Bioneers talk, and my question was, is it hippies that have a sense of humor, or is it God that has a sense of humor that these things show up in prisons and universities? Well, you know, I, I, am, I grew up in a Christian environment, so I, I can speak to this. I, 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 if I had a Bible, I'd have about 10 notches on it for how many times I've been saved. After a while, while it was definitely competition among some ministers who could save me, because I clearly was not saved by the other minister, so they're going to try to save me, right? right. So, um, but I, I don't want to give God a personality. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I thought, I'm a long-haired hippie, I look like Jesus. None of these Christians would pick me up when I was hitchhiking across country. And I mean, they like, would you pick up Jesus? Probably not. <laughs> Yet they have a hippie up on the wall <laughs> That's not, that right. they're, they're worshiping. So I don't want to personify uh, God. Um, and, the, and I think the need for us to look at an embodiment of God that looks like us, you know, in some fashion, you know, Eyes, head, legs. White, white. White. <laughs> well, it was very, very dark and became very white, whiter over time. Yeah. Um, but I do subscribe to the concept uh, that we share one giant consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I do subscribe to. And we're all just a small part of that. And how, like, the microbiome, the my assembly of microbes, you know, 100 trillion cells, 
uh, compared to you know my much fewer cells of actually human cells, you know these giant colonies and members of this organism that we share, I think extenuates out to uh, the concept of one giant consciousness. We're we're all met have limited amounts of consciousness which collectively comes together to one greater consciousness, and there is one giant consciousness. You can call it God, you can call it something else, but you know, for the lack of words, that's, that's the best I have. So Carl Jung wrote about the collective unconscious, and I wonder if that's what we're accessing when we ingest these. Why unconscious? Why not conscious? Well, that's what he called it. Well, mean, he's wrong. I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree <laughs> Take with that up with him, not me. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I know. It's kind well, of I'll try it next time. Okay, then okay, next journey. time around. Okay, yeah. uh, so just to wind things up, uh, I want to go back to Brian Murarescu's book that caused so many waves in the field of divinity and ethnobiology, saying that uh, the Greek Eleusinian mysteries, to go back to Ruck and Wasson, uh, was based on a fungus, and that uh, the Christianity, which we think of as rooted in, in Judaism, may have been at least as much, if not more so, rooted in the, this Greek religion, which again was rooted in fungi. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think um, I, I have two stories about that. I, um, I know a lot of people who are devout Christians mm -hmm. who came to Christianity from psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. About 15 years ago, 12 years ago, I'm, I'm guessing, I teach these workshops and I taught 3,000 students in tissue culture. This really a nice person showed up in my workshop. He's very quiet, very sort of in, introverted person. But he had that kind of glow, you know, mm -hmm. when you meet these people, you know, they're really sent, sentient. And he waited till everyone went away. Mm -hmm. um, from, um, and he, he sat with me um, and he said that he had been sent to me and to let me know uh, that the highest levels of Christianity mm -hmm. uh, are now filled with people who have come to Jesus through psilocybin mushrooms, yeah. and that was that was pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's more and more people like that. Many of them will never do the mushrooms again ever. They had that discovery. They have a new life, new understanding, and so. There is, a, it, there is a merging. Maria Sabina was a practicing Catholic. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I think all these things you know, point to this commonality of consciousness that we all want to think there is something bigger. We all know there's something bigger. But we can't articulate it. We don't know how to manifest it. And we have these different rituals and pathways, meditation, fasting, religious you know, study, uh, but it all goes into the same spiritual horizon. It's just that we're on parallel paths, and I don't think they're divergent. I think they're convergent. I think science and spirituality are now coming together, and this is a great point in, in the human evolution. Well, to me, one of the measures of a great shaman is when is a person who will tell you when you need to take an entheogen and when not. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in plenty of ceremonies where I said, "Can I? Should I take another cup?" And they said, "No, you've had enough." Or, "Hey, wake up, drink this," and and that's the measure of a real healer, not somebody who's just after your money or after your soul. And so, the idea that the more you take of hallucinogens, the closer you get to God is obvious nonsense. The the opposite can be true, right? But that these should be seen as vehicles to an end, some of which you may need to take the rest of your life. And some, I've, I've had plenty of people say, I took ayahuasca once and I got what I needed. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Yeah, I'm, you know, you got ayahuasca once. Hopefully it was from a trained therapist, mm -hmm. a person skilled. Mm -hmm. What I object to is the underground commercialization of psychedelics. Yeah. I'm gonna sound like, again, a total conservative here. But people involved in the drug trade, mm -hmm. they're not paying taxes. Mm -hmm. They're not accepting responsibility for the consequences of the sacraments that they're growing and giving to somebody else. Right. They have a bad trip. It's you own you. part of that. Yeah. And agree. suddenly you're anonymized from them, them and they I don't agree. know where they came from. They have no, so it's irresponsible, I think, to give a powerful sacrament without being there with a the person. I'm not a therapist, so I'm not the right person to be. So that's why I adopted a long time ago 
Nature provides, I don't. And so mm -hmm. the other thing is these same drug dealers, if their house catches on fire, they're going to call the fire department. Mm -hmm. They're freeloaders. Yep. They have freeloaded on the system. They're not paying taxes. Right. They're not paying into the commons. Right. And then if they cloak themselves in the veil of spirituality because they're trying to be spiritual, come on now. <laughs> you're banking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and not paying taxes, and you're pretending like you're doing it for spiritual purposes. Or protecting purposes. nature or helping the indigenous peoples that taught us. Yeah, this. so we have to be careful about the freeloaders yes. that are hijacking this message for right. their own personal gain right. without paying respect to the indigenous uh, you know, communities without mm -hmm. paying back to the commons, without you know accepting their share of social responsibility, okay. and that's so. I'm sorry if I pissed off some people there, to, but this to, is my my issue is that everyone should be paying taxes, or no one pays taxes, agreed. right? Uh, otherwise, you you know it's just not a fair system. So last last question, if you have a medical issue, and you go to a trained guide, and they give you pure psilocybin, and as an alternative, you go to a paramount shaman of the Mazatex, and she gives you the mushrooms. What's the difference? Well, the difference is quite large, and that's a wonderful question. If you have a severe psychological uh, challenge, you need a professional psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. If you have been experienced, like I think you and I are, mm -hmm. we're fairly emotionally stable. <laughs> I know that's a real sure. stretch. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing the envelope on this one, right? That's a big assumption. But I would rather go to a shaman. I would rather mm -hmm. go to the Mazatec and take a psilocybin mushroom Agreed. because I don't feel like I have the traumatic uh, issues that many other people do that require a professional psychiatrist with the best of medical support possible. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, the follow-up. Right. You know, these people go into the mountains, ayahuasca ceremony, have it, and then they go home. Yeah. They're totally separated. Yeah. You know, the people that go into a clinic or into a community of individuals where after the experience they have a therapeutic support mm -hmm. and they feel part of a community, mm -hmm. then, again, it's like the long tail. Mm -hmm. You can digest, you can reflect, you can process, you can come to a better space. Mm -hmm. But... It's, it's, I think, the support network and the degree of the mental challenge the person's facing would determine which is the best f for both. I don't think you and I would benefit going to Johns Hopkins, taking psilocybin, putting the blinders, blinders on. on, listening to classical music. <laughs> <laughs> I like some classical music, but most of it I don't. You know, right, I, right. I like sort of uh, a, 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 a Arabic electronica, uh, you know, the Buddha bar stuff. That's yeah, I don't thing. think they'll be playing this stuff at yeah. Johns Hopkins. <laughs> but anyhow, hey, the dead, the dead are great. They led the way. You know, the dead led the way in open source. They led the, they led a, they mm -hmm. built a community, a countercultural community. They were training. It was the new subculture of psychedelia, and it was a tribal community. Mm -hmm. It was an indigenous tribal community inside, you know, of a time when the United States and many parts of the world were involved in the Vietnam War and and protests. It was our community. Yeah. So you know, that was our tribe right. in a sense where we developed. Uh, many of the rituals, few of which have survived right. into medical practice, well, but some of which have. Kurt Vonnegut predicted that we would have to invent our own tribes because we'd lost that tribal cohesion in yeah. our industrialized culture. He's yeah. right. It's one example, yeah. one manifestation. Well, you know, a tribe is made up of many clans. Right. Right? Maybe we are one giant human tribe. Right. That's populated with many clans that have individual practices and histories. Yeah, but I think Vonnegut's point was everybody needs their own clan. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, we're part of the human tribe because there's how many billion of us now? Yeah. And people don't feel that they belong, and that's one of the reasons for so much mental illness, which I think is being addressed successfully in many cases or some of the stuff we've been talking about. Well, I just want to really applaud and, and recommend uh, the Roots to Thrive program mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit. They've now, again, I mentioned taken two cohorts. Roots to Thrive, yeah, Roots to, th to Thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E, mm -hmm. um, nonprofit program, uh, pioneered and led by a, a great team of, of health practitioners, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Pam Crisco uh, mm -hmm. being one of the leaders, and they have, they have developed a model 
Mm -hmm. that it's, it's based on indigenous wisdom. Indigenous elders are also part of, of the leadership mm -hmm. of this community. Um, and they've taken end-of-life patients who have a commonality. Uh, they face existential uh, you know, anxiety from getting a terminal diagnosis. They're going to die. Mm -hmm. So they come together and they do a high dose of psilocybin after preparation. And then they form their own community subsequently that they can process and talk. So you take the individual cancer patient who's terrified of dying. You put them in a community of other cancer patients or other people afflicted with you know, death-threatening illnesses, and they have a commonality of purpose and sharing, develop bonds and friendships. And I like to mention is when you do that, immunologically, you're elevated. Because mm -hmm. you're happier, you have purpose, you have friends, you're not as isolated. There's many articles in the literature showing that depressed people, emotionally depressed people, are immunologically depressed. And when they feel purpose and they feel happiness, their immune system upregulates. So, you know, psychological states can influence your medical state, state of being. So I want Roots to Thrive. It's based on indigenous wisdom and modern medicine. It's two eyes seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's a great model to, to build upon. Well, last point, because you brought this up, I think that one of the issues that this whole community doesn't discuss enough is this issue of death and dying and, and, and life after death. Because I think a lot of what we're doing here, especially you and me in, in this generation and Wade, we're kind of a connection between the Schultes <coughs> and Wassons who were connected to the 19th century and looking out for all the youngsters coming up behind us. And this work with these mushrooms, this work with these plants, this work with these indigenous cultures, it's to make sure they're perpetuated. They don't die. Absolutely. This is the legacy that they live on and they benefit humanity, and in so doing, they're preserved as well. Whether it's indigenous cultures, whether it's indigenous practices, whether it's plants and mushrooms. Because I think that's part of the struggle we're engaged in, to make sure these things don't just disappear. You know, Doña Julieta in Mautla told me, since I was a kid, two species of mushrooms have disappeared. We can't use it anywhere. They don't exist. Wow. And that's climate change. That was 25 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to go back to this thing of, of, of death. I rarely have ever told anyone this. Um, but, you know, I was always just academically thinking about death and life mm -hmm. and spirit. You know, mm -hmm. are there spirits? So it's, it sounds kind of woo-woo out there for all the reasons I explained. But I was at my father's side when he died. Mm -hmm. It was about 2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. He was in a coma for three or four days. And um, I was with him, and his breathing was deep and slow mm -hmm. and slowing. And then I was the only one in the room. Mm -hmm. And the very moment my father died, mm -hmm. he arched his back, he opened his eyes. I'm not kidding, his eyes turned blue. Wow. And he went, the death breath. Wow. I saw that, and I believed that there was a spirit. Yeah. yeah and yeah. anyone witnessing that, and many of you who have been with your parents have seen that, know exactly what I mean. I don't care if you're an atheist. WTF, how did his eyes go blue? Yeah. And I saw him, and I really felt the presence of his soul, his spirit. And when that happened, he was just a dead physical object wow. and that moment wow. convinced me that there is a spiritual universe it's just our ability to try to understand it is what we fail at and that's why so many religions have been so many so dangerous to so many of the minority peoples i i took a class in medical hypnosis and it was a week intense class so i got to talk to everybody in there Everybody was a nurse except for me and this other guy. And I said, why are you here? Why are you here? And all of them had the same two answers. They'd been abused sexually as children, or they were with people when they died. They knew there was something. Yeah, Doctors are yeah. not with people when they die. Nurses are. Yeah. And they said, when somebody passes, they somebody leaves. It. You can yeah. call it a soul. You can call it a spirit, whatever. They knew it. They saw it. And so this whole issue of, of death and this whole issue of sexual abuse, again, it ties right back into what we're here talking yeah. about. Well, I think, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, these other, especially these other tryptamine-based, you know, sacraments, I think they, 
weave us into this spiritual realm of nature that is in existence all the time, all around us. It is the presence that we are immersed in. So, thank you, brother. I can't top that, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My jaw is still hanging slack from that story. Wow. Thank okay. you for sharing that. All right. Thank you. So was that 20 minutes? That was probably an hour. <laughs> that was an hour uh, of five approximately. Hello. Oh, my God. Now I have to integrate. What? Oh, yeah. my God. That, what a treat. Thank you for Thank sharing you. all Thank that you, brother. stuff. That was so good. Hey, Pam. Thank you so much. I gave Rooster Thrive credit. I like that. You know, we have, like, thousands on our wait list, right? You do? <laughs>